talk to you this morning a little bit, and I want to give us something to uh, ponder this Christmas season, and uh, hopefully it will challenge us to think outside the traditional norms, uh, outside the cultural fads and fables, uh, because especially in a culture that is trying to normalize sin, we are basically normalizing missing the mark. And one thing, and that's what sin is. Sin is just missing the mark. And when you normalize missing the mark, you can never walk in the will of God for your life. And so the title of this message is The Trouble with Truth. The trouble with truth. And if you have your Bibles, look in Luke chapter 1. We'll start in verse 26. And there's a lot here. And I'm sure everybody's heard somebody preach about this, this time of year. And, um, but we're going we're gonna to kind of look at it, some things a little different. It says, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Now, there's a lot here that I think we miss a lot of times. And it's the first thing is Mary is pondering this greeting of favored one. Now, I just want to throw this out there to you and just to kind of make you think because a lot of times we often sterilize the Gospels. We often make the Bible this sterile, religious, whole, you know what I'm saying? That, and we often miss a lot of basic human emotion and feelings. Come on. And so... Mary is a young girl betrothed to an old man. And I never realized until I looked up, when I looked at Mary's song that she wrote after all this took place. And when you read about the song, she says, for he has had regard for the humble state of his bondservant. That's what she wrote down in her song. And you look that word humble state up and it means depressed. So here's what I want to throw out there to you just to get you thinking a little bit is that this angel shows up to this young girl who really didn't want to be married to an old man. Just think about that. You're being told who you're going to marry. You're being told this is what you got to do. There's no romance involved. There's no, get, come on, y'all hearing what I'm saying here? Just throwing this out there. So this Mary is having to ponder this angel showing up saying, 
hey, favored one, when you don't feel like you're favored. So Mary's having to wonder, wait a minute, my life is really not going like I want it to go. My life is not happening like I thought it was. So, come on. I really wanted to marry that. Come on. Certain situations, certain circumstances in your life may be happening right now that you don't feel like you're favored. See, this is the trouble with truth. The closer you get to it, the more troubling it is. The truth was, she was favored. The truth is, you're favored of God. The truth is, God's got great things for you. The truth is, God has a great plan for your life. The problem is, is you got to agree with it. That's the problem, is us agreeing with the troubling truth. Come on, are you hearing me now? See, that word favored one means grace or undeserved favor. We don't deserve it. That's why it's so hard to ponder at times because we're such a mess and we've made such a mess that we can't understand at times how come God loves us enough to send a baby to be born in a manger and to put angels in certain places and situations to watch over us until we can agree with the promise that has been made. Come on. And at some point, it's like that little girl Swapping a little bitty teddy bear for the big teddy bear. See, there's troubling truth. Mary finds this to be very troubling. And she's having to ponder this new truth about her life that she's favored. See, you got to figure, God hasn't talked in over 400 years. And the first two people she show, that he shows up to to talk to is uh, John the Baptist's dad, which then he becomes a mute and now shows up to a young girl and begins to explain what's fixing to happen. See, there's a lot going on here. See, the truth that is so troubling about this is that there's nothing traditional about this. Mary had to sit there and go, wait a minute. I would just as soon do this the traditional way. Come on. I, I'm not sure if my uh, fiance, <laughs> this is not going to look good on my Fiance resume. I'm pregnant by God. How do you explain that? Come on. Think about the, li listen, think about the how and the why. See, we get bogged down in how this is going to happen, and then how do we explain the why? See, there's some things you just don't have to worry about, the how, and you don't have to explain the why because, quite frankly, you're not going to be able to. People are just going to have to see and because they're looking at a seed, come on, and they can't see the sequoia. And for us, the very first truth is the fact that the troubling truth for us is the fact that Jesus wasn't born in December. <laughs> but that's okay. 
It's like me and Wendy, we're married in November, but we celebrated in August because we like to go to the beach. And the beach is not good in November. It's better in August. Come on. So that's okay. But see, there's a tradition that we have gotten caught up in that we celebrated in December. See, and that's the first trouble with truth is explaining that. Listen, and Mary could have very well said, look, I'm, I'm, I, I, I just want to do this the traditional way. I want to get married. I want to have kids. I want to, you know, she could have. See, the closer we get to truth, the more it troubles us to ponder that truth. See, your current situation isn't always final. That's what you need to realize. It isn't always final. One thing that I know for certain is that God is bringing order and correction to his body. And that's going to cause us to ponder some truth against lots of traditions. Lots of traditions. Because that's just where we are. We've always said here for 17 years now, this ain't church as usual. This just isn't church as usual. And so with that, there's a lot of truth that has to be pondered. And we've kind of held on to some traditions over the years to just kind of go along with because it seems harmless. But really, it's left a generation ignorant about the why. To the point now that we have a culture that says happy holidays. So how harmless is traditions? Come on, are y'all with me? Just giving us something to think about. See, we are now back to the troubling truth that unto us a Savior has been born. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Verse 10, it says, because here's the thing about truth. It's that we are responsible to teach it to our children. We're responsible for the truth, even when it's troubling, to teach it to the next generation. And let's look back in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 10. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb when the Lord said to me, Assemble the people to me that I may let them hear my words so they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth and that they may teach their children. Look in Deuteronomy 6. And these words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. Now turn to Deuteronomy 11. Chapter 11, verse 19. And you shall teach them to your sons talking of them when you sit in your houses and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you rise up, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates so that your days and the days of your sons may be multiplied on the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them as long as the heavens remain above the earth. For if you are careful to keep all this commandment, which I am commanding you to do it, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and hold fast to him. Then the Lord will drive out all these nations from before you and you will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Verse 24, every place on which the sole of your foot shall tread shall be yours. 
Shall, you can go on down through there. Verse 25. There shall no man be able to stand before you. The Lord your God shall lay the dread of you and the fear of you on the land on which your feet and he and as he was as he has spoken to you now i'm telling you right now the enemy there is a dread on this land of you knowing the truth of who you are there is a dread by the devil that you will take the responsibility to teach the ways of God. And that's why he has worked so hard to destroy and to kill. Come on. To separate, to divide, to make seemly, seem, seemingly harmless traditions. Come on. Joshua chapter 4. I'm going to turn there. Joshua chapter 4, verse 5. He says, <clears throat> I'll start in verse 4. So Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross again to the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Let this be a sign among you so that when your children ask later, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Listen, Joshua here was, the, here was the command. The priests were carrying the ark of the Lord. And when the priest put their foot in the water, the water cut off going downstream, but the water never quit coming. It began to heap up on one side. The water just began to go straight up in the air. And so now all the people crossing the Jordan, as long as the priest's feet were standing on the edge, and the people crossed the flooded Jordan, and they all get to the other side, and then their priests are still standing there holding the presence of God. And he tells 12 men from each tribe to go back. You get a stone that's big enough. You got to put it on your shoulder. Don't go out there and get this little. He said, you put it on your shoulder and you bring it back because your children are going to ask, why are these stones stacked up right here? And you're going to teach them because God did the impossible for us. You remember this day that God did the impossible. You remember the day when we were obedient to get our feet wet. Come on. See, they had to at least get their feet wet. See, there's always something on our side we have to do. You have to agree that nothing is impossible. Come on. See, history is vitally important for the kingdom of God to advance to the next generation. Why do you think the devil has been tearing down this nation's history? What, it, it's not people. Our war is not with flesh and blood. Come on. The Bible tells us who our war is with. Our battle is with an enemy who happens to have a voice with a bunch of people who haven't been taught to remember the Lord their God. Oh, come on, man. And so they're trying to tear... Listen... Our history does not have to be perfect. 
Because here's the deal. God doesn't use perfect people to do his plan. He just needs somebody to agree. That's what the devil's after. He's after your agreement with an almighty God. Come on now. If he can just get you biting at, oh, we're just going to have a tradition of a little fat guy in a suit flying around in a, come on. If you can, or a rabbit that lays eggs. Come on, are y'all hearing what I'm saying in here? I know that's uncomfortable. I get it. But I'm telling you what the word of God tells us to remember. And it ain't a little fat guy in a suit flying around by with a bunch of deer. It's about a savior that came and was born in a cave in a nasty, dusty manure. Come on. And don't tell me they clean this thing out every day or so. And it started when one young girl agreed that nothing is impossible with God. It all started when two men agreed with God that he would give them the promised land. Two men changed the entire nation. Two men built a nation Truth is, we're responsible. And those stones became a reminder of God's unmerited favor and grace on people who even when they messed up, come on, God still honored his covenant. Even when a young girl who was depressed, come on, in an humble state, God used her. Come on, the trouble with truth is it's the truth that God uses the least likely. The truth is God can fix our mess and change our outcome. That's the truth. But let me tell you something. It takes work. I'm not telling you this is easy. I'm not here telling you this is all just a pie in the sky. Let me tell you something. Mary still had to wrestle with the idea that she was pregnant and could be stoned. Y'all here. So what are we telling our kids the tree means? What do these lights mean? What does the gifts mean? See, we have an obligation to teach the truth, even when it's troubling to the next generation. Come on. So that they know the truth. See, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through the truth. Right? See, the truth sets us free. Even as troubling as truth can be at times, truth sets us free. Come on. See, to hit the mark, listen... God has a target for your life. And to hit that mark, you're going to have to get sighted in on it. See, we can't neglect the truth for the traditions of men because it seems harmless. We're seeing the effects of a culture who just go along for the sake of getting along. Come on, happy holidays, happy holidays. 
Why is it happy holidays? Because Christ must is offensive now. And we just allow that to happen. We've just sat back and we've just allowed that to happen. And we just go along with happy holidays. Look in Mark chapter 7. Are y'all with me? Is everybody mad at me? Mark chapter 7, verse 7 says, But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. Listen, well, I just, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't think some traditions are that bad. You know what this tradition was? Washing hands. How devastating is traditions of men? When Jesus points out, you worship me in vain. You worship in vain because you neglect the commandments because Jesus' dis disciples didn't wash their hands. Because they done made a tradition of washing their hands. There's some traditions that are so deceiving, but they seem so harmless. Come on. He says, you neglect the word of God and his precepts for cultural fads. That's what he said. Ah, don't kill the messenger. Come on. And for the record, we've got lights on our house, and we've got a tree, we got presents, and the, but we make sure the kids understand what it's all about. Come on, are y'all with me? I'm just trying to make sure we're teaching the next generation. Just trying to make sure we're not missing the mark here for fads. Come on. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. See to it. That's pretty powerful right there. You, you could just preach a little while right there. See to it. In other words, make sure this is done. That no one takes you captive through philosophy, empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Man, that, that's a lot right there. See to it that no one takes you captive. How many people go in debt this time of year? Captive. Come on. See to it. See to it. See, the, trouble, the troubling thing that we face with truth is the change. That's, that's the other troubling fact of truth is us having to change because here's what happens. We are like, oh, man, it's just too big a deal. Oh, man, what do we, you know, uh, I, I just, you know, it, it's just too much. Man, we're in the last days anyway. Everybody, you know, and, and so we, we get this mindset of we'll never, listen, you may never see the change in your lifetime. It may just be you that lays the groundwork for the change for the next generation or it may be you that are, are bringing in the supplies, come on, that make the change. But here's the deal. We can't duck our responsibility of killing the giant because all we have is a sling. Amen. 
we can't duck our responsibility of truth. Come on. When we know the truth. Are y'all with me? Listen. Again, this ain't church as usual. I understand. This ain't your normal Christmas message, Jesus in a manger and growing up. And I get that. But God didn't pull me off the back of the bucking chute to put me here to just come in here and make everything feel good. See, there's an overwhelming thought that what's the use? How can this be done? See, we can't pass on the responsibility of this truth. Luke, look in Luke 37. One, Luke chapter one, verse 37. He says, for nothing will be impossible with God. And then she said, let it be done to me according to your words. That's the most powerful statement in Christmas. The most powerful thing that you can ever give to your children, to teach your children, is that nothing is impossible with God and then agree with it. Let it be done to me according to your words. God's word is so clear on that you're favored. It just drives me bonkers when I hear guilt and condemnation preaching. It drives me, I would rather teach you how much God loves you and it says the kindness of God leads men unto repentance. See, guilt and condemnation preaching only tells you how sorry you are so that you will be a servant. Come on. But when you see exactly what all God did for you, you want to serve him because you love him then you're able to step back and see the seed become the sequoia. Then you can swap this little mess of a life for that which is good because you'll trust a God that you love. Come on. That God took his time and he patiently waited for that seed to grow for you. See, the word is so rich for our victory because there was a Savior born unto us through a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph who was favored, who agreed with the troubling truth. See, and that's the very foundation. If you can't believe that part, it's going to be hard to believe that nothing's impossible with God because I'm telling you, people try to explain it away all the time. But you can't explain it away. And let me tell you something. And I, and I get it. There, there's some people that put all the faith on Mary and pray to Mary. You can't do that. Mary was good and did it, but she's not our Savior. She's not the one we pray. She's not our high priest. Come on. Look in Colossians chapter 2. See, this puts a whole new different playing. All of it, when we get it right, it puts us on a whole nother playing field that the devil can't win on. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. For in him... 
all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. In other words, in him, all the abundant and completion, the abundant completion of deity dwells in bodily form. Look here. And in him, you have been made complete. Listen, in him, in the little baby Jesus that was born and grew up and died on the cross, in him, you have been made complete. You've been favored. Unmerited favor. The grace has come to you and made complete, and he is the head of over all rule and authority. What? All the rule and authority that's trying to change our history, trying to make you feel horrible about yourself, trying to convince you that you're not going to make it, trying to convince you, come on, that your life is over, that your situation, your circumstance, that's just it. Come on. Over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. In other words, there's no religious program or duty that can make you, come on, only Jesus. In the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us. And he was taken, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Look at verse 15. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. So you want to talk about Christmas? Tell your kids that back in Deuteronomy, God said, I will dispossess the land for you, that you can possess it, that you can be fruitful. If you want to tell them the Christmas story, you take them all the way back to the beginning and start teaching them how God wants us to walk in favor and abundance of blessing. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And when you can accept that, then you can accept in John 10, 10, where Jesus said, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I came that they may have life and life abundantly. And then I challenge you to look the word abundantly up and teach that to your children. Because it will blow your socks off. And then when you start lighting the evergreen Christmas tree, See, it's an evergreen because Jesus never dies. We put lights on it because he is the light of the world. We adorn it with ornaments because we love him. And we bring presents and gifts because it's not about getting, it's about giving. And he gave his life. One of the most precious Christmas cards that we received was from Selah, who made it.
herself. Because we were given a free gift from God that we could live in Him over all the rule and authority. He made a public display of the devil and the demons for you and I. That we could be victorious and possess gift that we got in such an humble state and if God can do that nothing's impossible nothing if y'all would stand see the issue now again is on our side be it done to me thank y'all for coming man what a testimony what a testimony of be it done to me according to your will it's no accident you're here this morning this is our family from Corsicana. What an amazing story of God that nothing is impossible. What do y'all want to agree with this year? And I, I look across this room and I see lives that have been turned upside down. That the enemy's attacked. That the enemy has attacked. Listen, and it keeps attacking, it keeps attacking until at some point you stand up and say, you know what? Be it done to me according to your word, Lord. Listen, you're favored. We just have to start making the right choices. We just have to start agreeing with what the word says and then start making those right choices because he said, see, I've set before you life and prosperity and death and adversity. Now choose life. That's what the birth of Jesus is all about. And there's nothing that you can do that he hadn't already done except agree with it. It's not in the clothes you wear or what you don't wear. It's not in how many candles you burn. It's not how many prayers you say. It's not how, come on. If the only prayer you know is, Lord, be it done to me according to your will, that's the greatest prayer you can ever pray. Because I'm telling you, he can take a mess and he can change your life, but you're going to have to, to come up against the troubling truth. The troubling truth is that you are favored and that he has great things for you. And he sent his son to die so that you can not only walk, you can walk in be victorious Father we come to you today Lord we thank you
for your son Jesus Lord we remember today what you have done for us to be victorious and that's why we celebrate Christmas is that you gave your son as a free gift that we might be saved and we thank you for that in Jesus name Amen.